94, we didn't have any retail competition. Yeah, tomorrow morning, we'll talk about that. Right. I'll, I'll that is really stressful. And then we need to look at partnership collaboration strategies. How can we again leverage our investment to bring new investments in and establishing a realistic benchmarks? That's what we need to be again. We need to, to have that roadmap, but also realistically with the recommendations of how to get The community visioning process normally has a lot of community involvement. So the most focus of it is to get the community involved, to see what they want. Um, for the future and uh, built on that and move forward. So we have interviews with stakeholders, community leaders, city board, key staff members. Uh, we're going to have, or normally these planning process have small visioning process. They have large group meetings. They have organizations that have an input and have a stake in the community come in and talk about their, uh, their vision for the community. And of course, the public open house to invite everybody to come in. There are also a, a lot of new tools and technologies that we can use uh, after, in, since 20 years ago, uh, which is a lot of GIS for detailed mapping and analysis, a lot of computer visualization so uh, lay citizens can really see if you change certain things, how does it actually look at so really, or, or what's going to come out if you, know, if you change certain things. This is going to be the vision for the city, or this is what the city is supposed to look like. Uh, some polling, just you know, they could do electronic polling, that could be in large groups, uh, do online surveys, data collection tools, and then access a lot of databases that are not available. You just have to basically bring it down to a target that you want because they're just, you know, the numbers are all, all over the place. You want the numbers that could really help you assess what you have in this case. There are many approaches of how you can get community involvement, and I can talk a little more for that. Yeah, so Dean has talked a little bit about the, the what and the why and the, the how to some extent. Uh, really from here and really the focus of the council I think needs to be on the who. And there's several different ways you can go about this. The large committee approach is the one that's typically used and actually is the one that we used in 2010. I don't remember the count, but I think we had 25 plus members on the steering committee for that, that process. So it's a very large committee. Uh, pros, you can achieve wide diverse representation from the community. Uh, you don't have to pick one sector as opposed to another. You can literally appoint someone from just about every place, uh, whether it's church, school, residential, commercial, uh, governmental. Uh, you can pick whatever demographics you want uh, on other things. And you can get uh, pretty wide representation because you just got a lot of members on the committee. So you get more involvement and you tend to get a sense of direct participation input from a larger number of volunteers. There's more people participating. Uh, you can customize it to fit council preferences, representative priorities. Uh, you tend to get a little bit more buy-in from a wider base of community, not just a small committee or a group of staff and consultants. Uh, also a larger group can to some extent control fringe views because you tend to get a normal curve type of uh, behavioral model and you have some people on one outside extreme, you'll have some people on another outside extreme regardless of what the issue is, but the larger group will probably tend to be focused on that 80% normal curve that's in the middle. And so the influences of any individual member are somewhat lessened and the, the group has more more control there. Cons, the larger the group, the less time there is for communication for individual. You know, you got 25 people in a committee meeting. Everybody wants to kind of express their point of view or say something, and you just give everybody two minutes, then you're up to an hour just for that two-minute discussion if everybody participates. So uh, some folks tend to hold back in those larger groups and uh, not express themselves as much as perhaps they might in a smaller group. Uh, coordination and communication lines you know, become a little bit more difficult, obviously, because of the size of the group and trying to get everybody moving in one direction and just trying to get everybody get, you know, together for meetings and things like that can also be more complex the more people you have. Uh, it can be very difficult to appoint. You've got to come up with you know, however many people you put on it. You've got to find those people and you've got to be people that are really wanting to participate in the process, otherwise you're going to be making reappointments, which you don't want to do. 
Um, so, uh, because of the size of the group, also the leadership from the chair is absolutely leadership from the chair is always critical, but it becomes more critical in a large group because you're having to do a little bit more cat herding and and management of those meetings to make sure that uh, they're run properly and, and everybody gets their their two cents in and nobody's dominating the discussions. Um, so typically what that would involve is a series of public meetings, charrettes, briefings, uh, surveys. Um, you can broaden this concept to basically do away with the steering committee. And so you can have a community input approach that doesn't really have a steering committee. You just schedule a series of public meetings, charrettes, briefings, surveys, open to anybody who wants to participate. It's something like what we did with uh, the, uh, the plaza, and I think we did it also to some extent with the Old Town Master Plan uh, a while back. That was also the approach we took in 2010. Uh, well, you had a committee as well. Yeah. And so, yeah. by the way, you can blend a lot of these concepts and, and use bits and pieces of any of them together. Uh, but if you wanted an exclusively community input approach, you wouldn't appoint a steering committee, you'd let the staff and consultants kind of be the managers or assemblers of the information and they would conduct these public meetings, these charrettes, surveys, briefings, etc. and you just advertise them and open them up to anybody who wants to participate. The pros are you don't have to make any appointments. Um, opportunity for anybody to participate, all they have to do is read about it and shut up. Uh, you got potential at least for maximum community input. Uh, you can use new tools like Facebook to assist in getting the word out and getting people to be aware of the process and to respond to it. Of course, uh, next slide, you've got some cons. You might not be successful. You might not generate the participation that you're looking for. People might be apathetic. They might not respond. They might be busy. They might not feel the intensity of the need to participate. And therefore, you might not get the participation and the feedback that you're looking for or the vetting that you're looking for. Uh, to overcome that, you really need a huge marketing and advertising effort to generate that participation. Go ahead. Just the, the Old Town Plaza was very successful, the Old Town planning that we did, mainly because of the size of it. It was very, compared to the rest of the city, it was very small. Yeah, it's a so limited we scale really project. The scope is very small scope comparatively. Limited, and that's why we were able to actually do a lot of direct mailing to the people and, and a lot of advertising to that limited group. But for the entire city, that's what it uh, you, you'd almost have to broaden your marketing to the entire city and then try to figure out who might be interested in showing up uh, to maybe focus your advertising a little bit more. And that's the difficult thing to do. Um, one of the problems with a broad community input approach is the participants are self selected You never know who's going to show up. Um, you know, there's some organization out there. You can have a group of participants show up and make it sound like an single issue is the most important thing that you need to deal with over the next 25 years when in fact it's just the issue that's most important to a handful of people. And that's something that you always have to guard against uh, in any of these processes is that uh, smaller issues don't become larger issues just because the intensity of a small number of people focused on them. Um, fringe views can dominate because of that public views are not present, so again, that's one of the difficulties that you have to recognize and, and hurdle. There's ways of doing that. Uh, more difficult to control for that reason for staff and consultants. Uh, you can get some disconnects between the input you receive and your preferences. You might uh, wind up with some really wild ideas that come out of a process like that. You might not be all that excited about some of them. It's just one of the dangers of uh, any process like this, I guess, but more so here. Um, more passive communities are going to get less participation, and so that requires more interpretation and direction from the staff and consultants. So that's the kind of broad, community-wide approach. Um, so you had, you had four pros and eight cons. Well, yeah, something more than that. As far as any committee, whether it's a big committee, small committee, um, Steering committee. Uh, by the way, school districts going through a process like this right now. I believe the school district has kind of a major steering committee, and then they have 
appointed subcommittees I was actually on one of the sub certain six or seven six. specific areas that are kind of feeding back to the steering committee. So you can use it again a combination or drilling down of these these approaches. Uh, but in terms of especially a steering committee or major committee, the appointment uh, we recommend making it by the entire council, not by individual members. But, uh, that's, that's up to you all. Uh, the representation, just some ideas about representation. Uh, obviously, need to involve the business community, need to involve neighborhoods, uh, both uh, property owners and residents. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, non property owners that live in Louisville and oftentimes are not uh, reflected in any kind of input or, or planning. Uh, preferably, a long term commitment to Louisville. It's interesting in that the 2020 or 2010 list of participants, uh, very few of them live here anymore. And so it's kind of interesting that you might have people you know, making plans for the future when they don't intend or that they might not be here for that future. How you gauge that, I don't know. Do the best you can. Uh, leadership qualities are important because the committee needs to participate, they need to talk, they need to get ideas, they need to uh, be involved, and typically that comes with people who are used to having some degree of uh, leadership in groups. Schools need to be represented, the Old Town area needs to be represented, there's lots of other areas you can pick from. Geographic areas, you might need to get some people from certain areas of the city. Other committees that you have, uh, if you can get as much a political input as possible. I think that's again representing a greater number of people in the community, uh, people who are communicators, and people most of all that have time that are going to show up and do your work. It's going to be a time consuming process, it's going to take an effort, and if they're not willing to commit it, they shouldn't be even attempting to serve on this committee. So, uh, our kind of recommendation. A mild recommendation because we're willing to go whatever direction you go on this. But you might have a small steering committee of involved knowledgeable people, seven to ten, combined with uh, doing whatever need uh, focus group meetings, neighborhood group meetings, targeted group forums, surveys, open house approaches that uh, the committee and the consultants feel like are necessary. Uh, you could again amend that to include subcommittees that are uh, looking at specific areas of interest that come out of the process at some future point in time. Uh, again, the more people you have on it, the more difficult it might be to get people to serve. So really what we need to know is uh, how you want to go about it. And we can get the uh, structure set up in an ordinance and uh, let you make any appointments that you want to make or provide a direction as you need to. So. It's a minimum 18 months process. That's the commitment, time commitment that anyone on the committee has to I, I would think one of the first things is which way you go, especially in the strict district work, I'd like to see you the post staff with our input or give us up something and then we can be additional input to it if it is a, uh, a, a job description that we give these people. Because that's the first thing somebody wants to know when you ask them if they want to serve with something. Well, what's it going to entail? What am I going to do? What's that 18 months mean? Yeah, that would be one of the first things you're going to 18 month commitment. And then some of the other things that you're going to be asking them to do, like the focus group, whatever power you're going to do. But I would think that'd be critical. And you give that, you have a little, you could do a little pamphlet thing or something. And then you give that to the people to make sure they're willing to commit to that. Yeah, a little bit of that on the next slide.
lends itself to a larger piece. I don't have a that seven to ten number. You know, if that's what we get, that's great. I, uh, I'm a I'm a fan of steering committees that can kind of spread the wealth. So I find that if you get too small, then they're carrying too much weight for 18 months. So you got to kind of balance that. So I don't know if the number at this point is more important than identifying the people and whether we all come back as a, as a council with a list or and we, we vet it from there or uh, I don't know exactly what, what we should do with the selection criteria but I'd rather focus on getting quality people and then we can decide what the size needs to be. There might be another way to do it. They just give everybody an assignment to come up with five names yeah. or five or more names. Yeah. As many as you want. Social media and, and web-based communication now is, it makes these work better because those people who are quiet may be louder online um, because they're going to do the research and they'll throw it up in that public space. Um, it also gives residents who are maybe a little bit more passive and gives them the opportunity to kind of look and see what's been written and what's being developed and they can get that in there as well. Uh, they, did, they did quite a bit of that in the, uh, the LISD one. And they broke it down. Their steering committees were like, 30 people, maybe? 30. Um, I don't remember what was on the 30. 30. Mm -hmm. And then they that's broke that. That's not counting the... That's not counting the sub So each subcommittee, there were seven, I think. It's either six or seven. I was on the I was on one of the subcommittees, and each of those committees had 25 or 30 people in them. Um, and we were, we, we were given, you know, the broad vision and mission that was built by the steering committee. And then we had the subcomponents that had to line up with that. And then we had to sell that back to the steering right. committee, and then they put that all together to create where the LISD is going. And that's that maximizing participation and buying. Yeah. Exactly. Other questions or comments? Okay, so what if we go back to uh, a slide where it showed the uh, different groups of people? So, looking at that, can anyone think of additional groups of people that we ought to try to solicit for? Not for profits. Churches. Churches. Want to add non nonprofit? They're not part of the business community. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm actually just asking. asking. Yeah, I'm asking. Yeah. Social agencies? Are you talking? What are you talking about? Uh, you know, top of mind, CCA. Well, it's, okay, so it's social agencies. Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Yeah, yeah, chamber chamber right. in there. I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind seeing a couple of big churches having somebody represent. Yeah. Yeah. Representing. Oh, oh, sorry. Those are businesses too. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we had. Right. You remember we were in that? It seemed like we had somebody representing. So long ago, okay, let's add to this list, if y'all make a make know this, to this list add uh, non-profit churches and social agencies? No, but that's not profit. Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Yeah. I think non-profit would follow them, so it's in the churches. They're non-profit too, but that's kind of different. Non that's they're just all, what y'all are throwing out there. Huh? They're all Like yeah. You know, I, I'd also like to see the uh, hotel industry, uh, you know. That's good. Hotel industry. Entertainment. Yeah, business okay. community. I mean, you could sell. Yeah, I know. I know that. We could sell some business. I know that they're a business, but they're more, you know, kind of a little more of a tourism type thing. And it's a big part of some of what we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Would developer be 
community business, different from business and community, or about the same? Subsection. 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 Subsection.